All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us once again on Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Show. Now, we have done three different episodes, Chris, on talking about ECM motors. Isn't that crazy? Can't believe it. I know. We're four months in right now. Right. So we've covered ECM constant torque. We've covered ECM constant airflow. We've covered ECM condenser motors. And so what we're gonna wrap up today is kind of going like a high level view, demystifying ECM motors in general and um, bringing in the ECMs really into the classroom. I also put together a fun little video we're gonna share that I wanna get your input on and, and find some potentially incorrect words. So I want you to pay real close attention to it. They're so close but there's better ways to explain it so i'm afraid <laughs> oh boy, a lot of fun. <laughs> i'm rolling up the sleeves let's Roll go please here we go <laughs> <laughs> and everyone as always we truly enjoy you hanging out with us spending your time talking about a changing industry we want to know where you're at we want to answer questions that you have so in the chat let us know where you're joining in from if you have questions along the way about our previous content or things that we're doing today, let us know. I mean, that's what we're here for is to grow our community. So thank you all for joining us. And what do you think, Chris? Want to uh, want to bring some clear definition to what ECMs really are? Let's have some fun. I like it. Uh, you know, as I was talking to you before the show about, um, I, I, it, it, when I come out and do classes, you know, Technicians don't have a lot of time out of the field. You're always teaching the nuts and bolts, the need to know, get out the door. Yeah. And we rarely get a chance to talk about the high level information. And, you know, we use the wrong terminology. We don't really understand where this motor fits in, where that motor fit. Why, you know, why are there two ECMs that seem to do the same thing, but they really don't and all that kind of stuff. Do and we've, yeah, we've talked about them in the different shows. You know, I can't believe we're on the fourth show already. It's been too much fun. <laughs> it's like when you go to your, you know, it's like you're headed to that ski trip and all of a sudden you're driving home. You're like, wait, what happened? Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> so um so yeah this is going to be a, a lot of fun i don't get to teach um all this information all the time uh some of it's going to seem a little ru rudimentary um i am going to start out with uh some basics just to make sure we're on the same page sure um you know the the terms of, uh, of motors in the hvac industry get um confused and convoluted depending on where you learned them you know, in, in the southern regions, in the northern regions, if you're a heat pump tech or a gas tech, um, you may think of motors as evaporator and condenser or indoor outdoor. So I, use, I like the terms indoor blower motor and outdoor fan motor. Right. Um, and I, when I start a lot of classes, I start here and say, just to make sure we're on the same page, an indoor blower motor doesn't mean it's indoors, doesn't mean the motor's inside the house. It means that's the air that it moves. It moves the indoor air from the home to the appliance and back to the home. Mm -hmm. And it could be in a gas furnace, an air handler, or a package unit, Modular which power. means that the indoor blower motor could be inside the structure or it could be outside the structure. True. So, yeah. So I just like to, you know, um, bring those terms in so that we're all on the same page. Again, outdoor fan motor, obviously it's the, uh, the fan that moves the air across the uh, condensing unit uh, or um, evaporator coil if we're in the uh, heating mode of a, heat pump. Uh, so that could be a split system or package system as well. And if you've ever worked on uh, like a through the wall unit or a PTAC for a hotel, you know, that outdoor fan motor could be inside the structure. So True. just just a little clarity in terms. Uh, I don't know, you know, I, you, you and I are both uh, nerds of reading schematics and manuals. And, you know, if you've read more than one OEM manuals, you've seen more than 10 acronyms used to describe yeah. these motors. <laughs> and it's always fun trying to figure out what those three letters, what, what are they trying to imply by, mm -hmm. you know, IDM mm -hmm. or, or whatever they've mm -hmm. used. So induced I always graph. I, and how yeah, graph exactly. In the <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we're going to talk about um, HVAC direct drive fractional horsepower motors. And again, you know, sometimes in when you're teaching the nuts and bolts, you don't teach these terms. You know, what does what does uh, direct drive mean? What does fractional FHP mean? Um, fractional horsepower simply means that uh, these motors are rated in fractions. Um, don't ask me why it includes one horse. I guess one over one is a fraction. I wonder. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I didn't yeah so until you mentioned it, and I was like, yeah, Ooh. fractional horsepower motors includes everything one horsepower uh, and below. Mm -hmm. And then direct drive simply uh, implies the uh, type of drive it is. So the whatever blade it's running, whether it's a fan blade, axial fan blade, or forward curve fan blade, 
um, that is going to be attached directly to the shaft of the motor. There's going to be no uh, uh, um, coupling or, or a shiv mm -hmm. in between the motor and what it's actually driving. It's going to be connected okay. directly to that. So just clearing up some terms. And then, oh, sorry. And then uh, the chart shows the um, typical horsepower ratings you're going to find on the indoor blower and the outdoor fan. Um, this is kind of interesting because if you go back, depending on how old you are, and I'm old, um, you know, back when air conditioning with it when it was in its infancy and gas furnaces were, were, were had been around for a while, you saw quarter, fifth, and third horsepower motors in in gas only systems where right. you didn't have to move. The nice. higher amount of air that's typically required for air conditioning, unless you got a 150,000 BTU furnace, then of course you're going to need a larger motor. But um, today, and when I say today, my career spans 30, uh, just we'll just say 30 years. Um, <laughs> you know, you don't see too many quarter and fifth horsepower motors anymore mm -hmm. in the indoor blower category. It's pretty much all third through one. And since the invention of ECM, which is over 30 years as well, um, you know, you see a lot more half and third half and three quarter horsepower motors than you do one and third because they're programmable right wow. so i can take a motor of a higher horsepower and i can make it act like a motor of a lower horsepower by programming mm -hmm. um, and i can take a three quarter horsepower motor and depending on whether i need 350 400 or 450 cfm per ton i can probably get a uh, five ton of, of airflow out of a three quarter horsepower ECM motor. So a little changing industry when ECMs were introduced. And then in, in the outdoor fan motor market, uh, the opposite shift has happened. You, you know, it was very common 20 years ago to see third quarter, ha uh, third quarter, fifth horsepower motors. And now, um, especially in your two and a half, two ton and one and a half systems, you're seeing the sixth, the eighth, the tenth. I even saw a 12th horsepower PSC motor the other day. Darn thing wasn't more. I mean, it was like an inch thick. It looked, it looked like a, it looked like a, um, a ceiling fan motor. Yeah. So it was interesting looking. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there's some of the ways the industry has changed and some of the terms that we use. Um, so there are basically four types of motor technologies used in fractional horsepower, uh, HVAC. Um, and those include permanent split capacitor, which the acronym is PSC. We will talk a little bit more about that. You've got constant torque ECM, and then constant airflow, and then constant speed, which you announced at the beginning of the show. If you haven't, if you haven't caught the previous three shows, we've we've done a special on each one of these shows, so or each one of these motor groups mm -hmm. uh, technologies. So you can watch those uh, webcasts and uh, learn all about those motors. But the most common application of these motors is kind of interesting. Um, I, I often get asked, well, how do you know that's a, a constant speed motor? And I, well, because it's in the outdoor application. Well, how do you know? It's just where the industry has landed that technology. They don't, the industry doesn't typically apply a constant speed ECM to an indoor blower motor. Conversely, the industry doesn't typically use a constant torque programmed motor as an outdoor fan motor. So you find constant torque and constant airflow in the indoor motors and constant, excuse me, constant speed in the outdoor motors. And we're gonna talk about that at the end. We're kind of, we'll kind of wrap back up with that. Um, but that has a lot to do with the, the uh, air it's moving and the type of blade it's turning. So whether it's a forward curve fan or an outdoor fan, the, the programming, constant torque, speed or airflow um, some some of those programming methods work better with different types of blades and under different types of loads. So that's a little little teaser there for the mm -hmm. end of the sure. presentation. Um, I also wanted to work in a little bit of history yeah. because um, I I think I don't know maybe it's just me. You know I got I got older and I became a history nerd. I wasn't really a history nerd when I was a kid, but um, history became more issue when I got older. You know, um, that, but it's. It's interesting if you watch this progression, and it's sort of interwoven in the presentation. Um, it's it's sort of eye opening where ECMs came into the industry and how much earlier they were around before most people thought they were in the industry. Exactly. So um, if we focus on the indoor blower motor side of the industry, and we talk about new equipment built, and we go all the way back to 1986, and there's you'll understand why I chose. 1986. It's not just because I graduated that year, but we go all the way back to 1980s. Little giveaway there. Hey, hey, <laughs> <we're not numbers. laughs> you go all the way back to 1986, and in the indoor blower um, uh, uh, application of yes. new equipment, 
the number one motor used was a PSC direct drive motor. Now I know there's somebody that's out there saying, Oh man, there were, there were belt drives back then. And there were still some shaded. Yeah, there were some belt drives and some shaded poles, but the primary motor technology and HVAC equipment in 86 was, was a direct drive PSC motor. And it doesn't matter if it was a air handler, fossil yeah, fuel yeah, a, package unit. That was, needed. that was the technology. Right. And the reason why I like to go back that far, there's a couple of reasons why I like to go back that far. It helps understand the integration of ECM, but also because, um, you know, we did, we did three webinars on uh, our web webcasts, webcasts mm -hmm. on uh, ECM motors. And we talked about PSC motors for probably a collective five minutes. Yeah, not a whole lot about it. I mean, it wasn't. Nope, not a whole lot about it. But yet there's still the largest volume of motors used in residential HVAC today. Um, and, and in tech support, I'm, I'm reminded every day how, much, how many contractors have, have not been taught as much about PSC motors as they have about ECM motors. So Ooh, it's just going to take a little bit of time here, go back and talk about the PSC motors. Um, PSC again stands for permanent split capacitor. It's an induction motor that uses an externally connected run capacitor to help with its starting and provides additional efficiency. You can identify it a couple of ways. You can physically see it, uh, follow the wires out and hey, what's that silver, yeah, silver thing? That. That's the cap and that's, a, oh, that's a PSC motor. Or you can look at the um, uh, schematic on mm -hmm. the motor, kind of, you got a little pictorial there showing you the cap. And you can see in the ratings where you've got the microfarad and voltage ratings uh, of that capacitor. Can't, I'm sorry, every time uh, PSC motors come up, I always have to say, if you're ever replacing a cap, make sure you replace it with the rating on the motor, not with the rating of the cap that was there before. Always yeah, check exactly. the always check the rating on the motor. Sorry, little little plug for proper. Nope, never, this is all helping <laughs> educators know how to relay this to the classroom. Yeah. This is all stuff that could be potentially missed. Yes. Yeah. So if we switch to the outdoor fan motor, again, just talking about, I know we're in the indoor blower motor category in our, in our history lesson, but we're in PSCs, so we'll talk about the outdoor fan motor PSC as well. Again, you can see the uh, run capacitor out here. Most commonly in the outdoor unit, it's a dual run capacitor. So you've got a single common terminal with an F terminal for the fan uh, uh, motor and an H terminal for the compressor. I know H doesn't go with compressor, but it does if you know, yeah, hermetic, there you go. And then you can identify it by the um, diagram on the side of the motor as well. And again, the rating on the motor. So PSC motors, um, commonly built in two sizes, uh, either six pole or eight pole. Um, and that's important because the blower wheels and fan blades that were used when PSC motors were king, and, and again, they were king up until just a I couple of years ago, yep. um, you know, the, the fan blade and the PSC mo uh, in the uh, fan blade and indoor or blower wheel for PSC motors or 825 RPM because those were your high speed RPM values of six pole and eight pole motors. Um, and with P technology, I mean, we're not going to, we're not going to drill all the way down to the amount of poles times the frequency, you know, divided by two. Uh, but, you know, the poles and the frequency determine the RPM. If you want a motor with a significantly different RPM, such as going from six, uh, 1075 to 825, you have to get a completely different motor. You you can't run a 1075 motor down at 800 RPM. I mean, you you can, but it would be horribly horribly inefficient and creating creating a lot of heat and probably wouldn't last that long. So um, it's it that information will be very valuable when we progress into ECMs and understand the value of ECMs being programmable, but yet the fact that ECMs were used with the same blower wheels and fan blades that used to be used on the PSC motors and why they still operate around those typical mm -hmm. 1075 and 825 RPMs because the, the wheels didn't change, but the motor technology, the wheels and fan blades didn't change, but the motor technology did. Um, so you've got indoor blower motors, typically multi-speed. Mm -hmm. uh, they're multi-speed because uh, quite often you've got a airflow requirement for the fossil fuel appliance that is different from the airflow requirement for the outdoor unit, whether it be mm -hmm. AC or heat pump. And then you've got the outdoor fan motor, which is typically one speed because it's engineered by the manufacturer to run at the one speed necessary. Uh, again, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're in 1986. Right, we're talking we're not about in the two stage yet. Sing, yeah, single stage equipment. Very good, good, good catch there. So, you know, one speed, it's been engineered to operate at the one speed that maximizes the condenser TD across that coil. And that's what it does its whole life. So very simple motors. Um, and 
the average efficiency of a PSC motor is around 60 to 70 percent. Um, they often get a bum rap. They often get they often oh they're 60 percent efficient motors. Um, outdoor fan PSC motors are can can get up as high as 70 percent mm -hmm. um, because they are um, they are optimized to run at at, at the uh, most energy efficient RPM range of a given motor with a given load in a given system. So when you when you pick the RPM point on the on the performance curve that is yeah. the most efficient, and you design your blower blade around that, then you can get quite a bit of efficiency out mm -hmm. of a PSC motor. Sure. But when you're using uh, multi-speed motors, the challenge with multi-speed motors is when you um, slow a PSC motor, any induction motor, down below its synchronous speed. So I said we wouldn't dig too far, but a six pole motor synchronous speed would be 1200. So any speed below that is moving away from its synchronous speed. The further you move away from synchronous speed by going to medium or low speed, the, um, the more inefficient the motor gets, the more heat it creates because the less mechanical energy it's creating. Um, so multi-speed uh, motors uh, have these um, extra windings. And so we, you know, we add resistance, re uh, more resistance, uh, less amperage, less amperage, less torque. So, you know, we've, we've called these motors multi-speed motors forever, um, but technically they're, they're multi-torque motors. Um, as I reduce the amount of torque the motor can, can generate, uh, the blower wheel slows down and the speed changes. So, you know, going from the high speed to the medium speed, which is really going from the highest torque capability of the motor to the medium torque capability of the motor, I slow down in RPM, so we call them multi-speed motors. It's kind of tomato, tomato, it means mm -hmm. the same thing, but I use this uh, as, as the setup for the next motor we're gonna, or the second motor we're gonna talk, third motor we're gonna talk about, which is constant torque motor, where we're gonna start to understand that ECM motors absolutely focus on torque and speed or just torque. Um, they're not, they're not multi-speed motors at all. Um, and, and why I go back to the PSC motor and say, well, they, they really never were. They're, they're multi-torque motors that run slower when you go to a lower torque value. Man, I'm glad you, I'm glad you represented it that way. Cause I actually haven't thought about that from that perspective, but hundred percent it, when we change the resistance, we're changing the capable torque of the motor consequently changes the RPMs of it. Yep. Yeah, and another thing that is kind of interesting, since you you gave me a pause there, you you know you know you know when you're teaching, your brain's going a mile a minute, yeah, and sometimes yeah. you stop and you think of something else. Yeah. You know, we're gonna when we get to the ECM, we're also gonna understand how one motor can be more than one horsepower very easily by programming, and I don't need to build many different motors to do one thing. In other words, I can have one ECM that takes the place of five ratings of PSC motors because of a wider operational range and the fact that it's programmable. I can tell the motor what torque I want. I don't have to actually tap the winding. So on a PSC motor, let's say, let's say on this PSC motor, I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen. Let's say yeah. what, I, what I really wanted was I wanted a torque that was right about here, right? Yes. Well, I can't do that unless I'm gonna, you know, do a YouTube special and open up a motor, break the windings open and, and solder a wire in there. I, I can't get that torque value. It's been built, you know, with the windings tapped here and here. But with an ECM, I can program it to give me that torque value or that torque value or that torque value. So I, I really open up the capability of a motor when I have programming versus tapped winding. And a tapped winding motor, it is what it is. It's never going to be anything else. Hmm. Okay. Great way to explain it. I'm sure there's a lot of teachers out here going, okay. All right, this makes sense. This is to <laughs> deliver my content now. There you go. That's mm -hmm. what we're that's what we're shooting for. The other thing that I think is kind of interesting, and um, this uh, there's I, I I can I, I can hear five or six people out there yelling, "That's not right." Um, you know, a PSC motor really only has a value in HVAC, in forward curve fan systems, and even in in outdoor fan system, only has a valuable operating range of about excuse me, two to 300 RPM below its rating. So let's say you have a 1075 RPM motor. It's really only good to around 850, 900 RPM, some, somewhere in there. Because once you start slowing the motor down below, and, and you can operate it lower than that, but you operate it at an extremely inefficient place where it could be running less than 30% efficient. Mm. And it's going to be, because it's not generating as much mechanical energy at the shaft, 
it's going to be creating a lot of heat. So you're probably going to have a, a, a significantly reduced lifespan. So I'm not saying they can't operate below that range. They're just they're they're valuable. They're long term operating uh, ra uh, operational range and, and for efficiency and longevity is two to three hundred RPMs less than you know than what they're rated at. So there again, if I want one motor to operate from say 600 RPMs all the way up to 1200 RPMs, can't do it in P PSC technology. I'd need two motors. In a system, and uh, interestingly enough, we we went me and another um, uh, trainer at uh, Regal Rectioner. We asked the engineers once, "Well, couldn't you build one?" And uh, just for fun, they actually did build one. They built a multi-pole motor, all in one motor, and it was it was half horsepower. So this is a half horsepower ECM. It was half horsepower, but it was this long because <laughs> it literally had to have two sets of windings. Oh, separate windings. It, yeah. yeah. And it had like 16 wires coming out of it. It was it was it was really and truly the family truckster. It was not it was nasty looking, um, but it was into a you know, replacement <laughs> universal. Right. Work. Yeah, but it was truly a six and eight pull motor all in all in one casing. Interesting. All right, so um, this is where we left off in the history lesson. We we took we, we took a, a, a side you know, the oh, off yeah, ramp to PSC on. Motors for a little bit, <laughs> but we left off 1986 saying that back then all indoor blower motors were using PSC technology. So if we fast forward to 2005, mm. and it'll become clear in a few minutes, like yep. why did he, that's a very obscure year to jump to, but it'll make sense. There's always a method to the madness. Mm -hmm. I need to borrow your Einstein here when, mm -hmm. I, say, when I say that. Oh. <laughs> so um, ECMs were introduced in 1987. There you go, method to the madness. Um, ECMs were introduced in 1987. That's why I chose 1986 as the starting point mm -hmm. because the very next year we started ECM, we started introducing ECM technology. Mm -hmm. So if you fast forward to 2005, which if my math is correct is about 18 years later, um, we see that in the indoor blower motor market of brand new equipment mm -hmm. that ECMs had gained about 15% of the market share. And um, I don't know about any one of you that may or may not, you know, do investments or focus on investments or investment in manufacturing companies, but that's not a good business model for, to, mm -hmm. to, to penetrate only 15% of the industry in 18 yeah, years. years. Yeah. Um, but, it, but there's a very good reason why, and I'm going to explain that in just a minute. So, okay. so 18 years later, 2005, we've got ECMs in the industry. Um, we've gone through multiple iterations in that time frame. Anybody... Anybody that's been around long enough remembers the old oh, yeah. square back one. Oh boy! And then, uh, and then we uh, progressed to the one with no paint on it that looked uh, mm -hmm. kind of weird. And then the 2.3, which is the name of this motor that uh, went from 98 all the way to 2013. So, um, so whether it's air handler package or fossil fuel, again, only about 15% of units were using ECM. So before I tell you why only 15% of the industry had, had switched to that technology, let's take a little, another detour and talk about what is ECM. Because we've, mm -hmm. we've done three um, discussions so far on each one of the ECM technologies, and we've drilled down, explained the nuts and bolts of how they work, the diagnostics, the airflow, but we've really never explained the technology itself, the, 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 what's going on on the inside. So ECM, of course, stands for Electronically Commutated Motor. Um, if you're one of those typo experts, you know, you don't like to type ECM or electronically commutated motor motor. So, you know, it's really EC motor. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just ECM. Yeah. Um, EC motor. Yes. Well, and I, and I have to say that because um, very recently there was an, a, 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 I think it was a manufacturer, it may, have, may have been another training organization, but they were calling all their motors EC motors. And I started getting these phone calls. I say, hey, are these, are these EC motors brand new? Or are they just like yours? Like it's an ECM, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're on the phone, you could just hear them turning red. Like, oh, I, sh yeah. I should, oh, I should have known that. Gosh, okay. I'm, 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 I'm all good. Never mind. But we, we have these other terms that also get used and the uh, brushless DC and permanent magnet. And the thing is, is these terms are a part of the technology of the motor. So an ECM technically, you know, I'm going to read this verbatim. It's a brushless DC three-phase motor with a permanent magnet rotor. The motor phases are sequentially energized by the electronic control powered from a single-phase power supply. Probably could have read it without staring at the screen, but I like to get that one exactly right because it was written by one of my engineers. And there you go. I, I, you know, I want to plagiarize properly. So, but we end up with these terms. What is permanent magnet motor, PMM? What is BPM, brushless permanent magnet, BLDC? What do these all mean? 
Well, basically, to understand that, you have to understand everything that's going on inside of an ECM because these terms are bits and pieces of the technology. So in an ECM motor, in the control, so you see here, I've taken the control off of mm -hmm. the motor. So here, here's the motor. I know you can still see me on the little screen there. Yep. And here, here's the control. Yep. I know you can see it on the screen, but I wanted to pop it up. So the, um, uh, okay, so I've, I'm, uh, I'm at the point where I've got AC power coming in. I'm converting that AC power to DC power. And now I have a clean DC power source inside my ECM control. Okay, good to go. Yep. That, that volts DC power is going to power my microprocessor, just like it does in your home computer, your laptop, your phone, you know, any, anything you're using. But that DC power is also going to go through my frequency drive, and it's going to operate the motor. So going to the motor, and this is where, this is where in, in many classes, I'll finish this sentence or this phrase, and I'll pause, and I can see a little bit of smoke coming oh, out of here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This right? Is, so this is so really nice. what is actually going to the motor? Is it, D, is it DC power or is it AC power? Well, it, on an oscilloscope, it actually, it, it would look like an AC sine wave. It looked look like a three-phase AC sine mm -hmm. wave. But if you look a little closer, you're going to see ripples in the in the in the uh, flat areas of that sine wave and what those ripples are is that is not actually a clean sine wave it is a pwm uh frequency drive yep. that's turning the power on and off on and off so it turns an on and off from zero to positive voltage on and off from zero to negative voltage over a, over a proper amount of timing and it ends up looking like an ac sine wave and you might think well Boy, that would have to be going on and off really fast, and and it is. It's around 20 kilohertz, um, which is 20,000 times per second, right? So, um, I you know my analogy because I like analogies. They help people remember things and relate. So the lights in most of your rooms are probably you know um, fluorescent lights, and they're yeah. running off of ballasts, That's and driven. they're they're actually turning on and off because they're running at a certain frequency. Yep. But I, you know my light doesn't. I don't. This isn't you know the, this isn't the 70s. This isn't a strobe light. You know yeah. I'm not I'm not doing the, you know, the, the <laughs> but but t but yet this light is actually turning on and off so quickly it just looks it. like continuous <laughs> light, mm -hmm. and so that's what's happening in an ECM motor. I. I am truly sending DC power to that motor winding, but that DC power is being pulsed on and off at proper intervals so fast, it just looks like a three-phase sine wave going to the motor. And I put these two up here, and I, I, I didn't want to get too nerdy in here, and I didn't want, to, I didn't want us to be here till like should, <laughs> 10 o'clock at night. But, but yeah, well, we, well, we've already gone down the rabbit hole. Now we're going. Now we're going into the uh, the rabbit hole cave. The cave. <laughs> um, so if you look at this sine wave, um, in, in the early years of ECM technology, uh, this was called uh, sort of a trap drive, um, a, tra a trap wave, trapezoidal looking waveform. And um, so technicians would often ask in the early years, you know, why does the motor kind of rock, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and then and then take off. And so, again, if you think about this technology came out in Windows, or sorry, in uh, 87, you know, do you, do, you, do you remember how powerful Windows 95 was and how yeah, slow it was? Right. So, so think about that era processor being in this motor and having the responsibility for directing the frequency drive to do all this work. So it didn't do it very fast. It had to get rotor positioning back from the motor to know that it was starting the motor in the right direction. And so all this took a couple of seconds to happen. So in the early ECM technology, the motor would and then and then take off. Yeah. But if you've ever paid attention to an ECM from the last 10 years or even five years, they just seem to take off. There's yeah. really no rock. If they do rock, it's so slight. You have you got to you got to be like, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to catch it. I'm going to catch yeah. it. You know, and, and, it, and it barely moves. Well, that's because now we have what's called a sine wave drive. Yeah. And the sine wave drive creates a sine wave that actually looks almost exactly like a true waveform, still being pulsed. But now that I've got a, a more powerful microprocessor, I can I can create that wave. I can stitch that wave together more cleanly, and I I get less of that starting fluctuation. Man, now we're getting into the nuts and bolts. This is what we teach in class, right? That's yep. the whole point of diving into what are we looking at? How do we teach this in our class? How do we make this more comfortable? And so it's important to understand what that control is doing, what our motor is doing, how it's constructed. I think this is a good time. I want to introduce a, another <laughs> perspective for us to have in the classroom. 
when we're talking about ECM motors, like, so if we take the, the, the mod, the control off from that motor, Chris, we're stuck with a three phase motor that has a rotor inside and we have our stator on the outside in a three phase position. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute because I, I get this question fairly often. Are there, are there ways that we can show the motor in, in, in an electrical way that makes sense for technicians? Can we use it for different purposes? I do this in classroom and I've resurrected one of my old training projects to be able to show that that three phase motor is really an interesting component that we can use for other purposes. Now, we've talked a lot about the, the construction of it and I want people to pay attention, see if you catch the terminology that could be, um, could be construed a little bit off, but is kind of right. So <laughs> I want you to think well about put. it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I need to put, do a little adapting to it, but I threw this together just for our educators to be able to put motors into a perspective that is a little bit more hands-on. So are we ready? Huh? Roll All that beautiful right. bean footage. Here we go. Well, hello everybody. Did you know that an ECM motor is the perfect tool for teaching electricity in the classroom? Well, let's think about this for a minute. What is an ECM motor? Remember, we've talked about the ECM motor is a three phase induction motor with a controller that uses the DC voltage to create a simulated three phase AC sine wave. But we're really taking single phase AC, feeding our control, our control is now going to convert our single phase AC into a DC signal that we use to pulse the three phase wires of our induction motor. Well, how can we use that to teach electricity, you say, huh? All right, let's break this down a little bit simpler. If we remove the control off from the back of our ECM motor and we just get rid of it all together, all right? That's our control. Single phase in, pulsated DC in three phases going out. All right, got rid of that. What do we have left? Well, we've got a pretty heavy duty rotor inside of a stator. Now, if we think about this from a motor perspective, if I apply three phase power, if I induce voltage into my magnetic field, I am now going to disturb my magnetic field and create rotation of my rotor inside of my stator. Well, what if I went backwards? What if I created momentum? I created force on my rotor that introduced a change in our magnetic field. We would actually begin generating with our motor. So a three-phase motor is a three-phase generator as well. We're just changing directions of how we're utilizing our energy. Aha, now you know. So how do we implement that into the classroom? Oh, well, that's pretty simple. We take a three-phase motor off from an ECM, we mount it onto an electric bike, and ha ha, voila! Electromagnetic energy converted to electricity. That's pretty simple, isn't it? All right. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> I don't think anyone <laughs> caught it. <laughs> so when, the where I after after doing this video and after talking to Chris, I, I kind of step back and I think, okay. I, could, I am off a little bit there. So when we talked about the induction side of a motor, Chris, what we were truly talking about was a slightly different style of motor. So I really need to reframe that a little bit and talk about the motor. So let's, gonna, let's look at what induction really would look like. So I took this motor apart, uh, and this is obviously an ECM, but if this were a PSC motor, the, the rotor 
would uh, would be made of aluminum bars. Mm-hmm. And I would still basically have the same stator. I'd still ha- basically have uh, steel with uh, um, uh, copper wire, uh, wrapped around the, uh, the uh, laminations. Mm-hmm. And so in a PSC motor, uh, this, this rotor would have no magnetic effect when there's no power to it. But when I put energy to the stator and I start creating a magnetic field around mm-hmm. this stator, that magnetic field is going to induce a magnetic effect into the rotor. And that's actually where the term induction motors comes from. That rotor doesn't have any magnetic effect and can't follow the rotating magnetic fields until the rotating magnetic fields establish themselves and do some of that magnetic effect into the motor. It's also why the PSC motor is less efficient than the ECM. It doesn't have near as much to do with the electronic control, the, the electrical efficiency, doesn't have near as much to do with the electronic control module as it has to do with the permanent magnet rotor on the in, in, inside the ECM. So when you add a permanent magnet rotor to the, so this is a three phase motor, no, no, no qualms about that. Question is, and this is maybe a, this is a question of maybe, you know, engine, engine, engineer speak versus technician speak. <laughs> this is deeper than me. <laughs> <laughs> is it an induction ECM motor? Is it an AC ECM motor or is it a DC? Or, no. Three phase motor. Three phase, is it yeah. a, you know uh, induction AC or DC three phase motor? Well, I've got a permanent magnet rotor in the middle. Okay, mm-hmm. so I don't need to induce a magnetic effect from the stator into the rotor to generate that magnetic ma- magnetic effect. It's already there. So it really is somewhat improper to call it an induction motor. But if you're teaching this to a technician who's not an engineer and just needs the concept of, oh, that's just a basic three-phase motor, then calling it a three-phase induction motor helps them understand, oh, it it's going to have three windings. Those three windings, if they're working properly, should all ohm out with the same ohms. Yes. I reverse any two phases. The motor will change direction. So I think it's okay at a high level. Well, when I'm teaching contractors and technicians, right. yeah, it's a three phase, it's a three phase uh, uh, AC induction motor because they're going to get that impression of how they would diagnose it. And that's perfectly fine. At the technical level, it's really just a three phase DC motor or to what was used earlier, a three phase brushless Brush. DC motor. So, and uh, when when I bring that up, I'm sorry. The kid in me always wants to go back to my Tyco race car sets, right? Yeah. The little yeah. little oh, Tyco yeah. cars. Those little those little rotors were were were, were little magnets. And yeah. you know, if you when you when the car was completely destroyed, you'd tear it apart and you'd throw the magnet at things, see see what it would stick to. Absolutely. Um, and then when the car would slow down, you'd go to the you'd go to the hobby store and you'd buy new brushes. And what did the brushes do? The brushes flipped the polarity so that the magnetic field kept going back and forth and made the rotor go around. So that's where these terms come from, brushless DC. Is it a DC motor? Well, technically, yes, because the power being sent to the motor is DC. It's it's not AC, AC. but it looks like AC to the motor, and we generate the same alternating current in the winding that causes the rotor to follow. We just don't need to induce that current into the rotor to create the magnetic effect. So a couple of things happen from that permanent magnet rotor. We get not only a uh, better efficiency, uh, but we also get a smaller stator. So if you in, uh, uh, if you would put that one back, the motor back on the screen. So if you look at this motor, let me turn it so you can't see the nasty looking label. And you look at the size of this, I probably should have a, 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 a measuring stick out, but from here to here, from, from uh, vent to vent, that's about an inch and a half. That is the stator stack of a half horsepower ECM motor. If that was a, a PSC motor, that stator stack would be easily an inch longer. Yeah. Yeah. So how is an ECM stator that's shorter, less copper, able to still create a half horsepower of torque? It's because in a PSC motor, I'm wasting a certain amount of energy magnetizing that rotor. So I need that bigger stator to create the same amount of torque. With the permanent magnet rotor, I've already got all that energy that I would have had to induce. I've already got all that energy in the magnet. I don't have to use that energy in the ma- to create the, the magnetic effect. Therefore, my stator becomes even more powerful in a smaller size. So a couple yeah. of things happen from the permanent magnet. We get, the better, we get better efficiency, and we also get a smaller profile of the stator stack of the motor. Yep. 
Good point. One thing I did want to throw out there before I get too far away from the uh, ECM exercise bike, if you are creating one for your lab, make sure that you are looking at it from the perspective of creating and generating electricity. That is a non-grounded three-phase circuit. So I'm actually producing a 208 to 240, depending on your RPMs, I can produce anywhere from 150 to 250 volts AC three-phase that I then separate out into 120 volt phase between. So I have three separate circuits going there. Very clearly labeled that as a non-grounded circuit and should be safely grounded if we're utilizing it inside of a classroom. So just throwing that stipulation out there just to make sure anyone sees that and goes, oh, I've got to do that. Just make sure that we are doing it safely because now we are producing and generating electricity. Absolutely. So um, on the screen, uh, one more point of discussion before we leave yeah. this this particular rabbit hole. <laughs> I think I feel like there's more to come. <laughs> no, it uh, might um, be a fifth month, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> those wascally webbits. Right. So uh, on the on the left, you see what uh, the early um, uh, ro uh, rotors looked like in ECM motors, and they were using what was called iron ferrite. So uh, a, it's ro they're roughly a quarter inch thick. Um, I believe this one is an iron ferret. Yep, I'll hold that one up to the camera if you want to see it. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's about a quarter of an inch thick. Um, and you can see it's, it's actually in, this one's actually in three segments. You can kind of see it there. Um, this, the segment goes from, from here to here. And then the next segment goes to here. You can kind of see that little dimple there and then comes around to here. So, mm -hmm. so um, three individual uh, pieces of iron ferrite. But as um, technology progressed, um, we started using neodymium. And neodymium, I'm going to throw a number out. It's probably not right, but I'm going to use it. You know, it's 10%, 20%, 30% stronger than iron ferrite. So what happens is I end up with a much smaller magnet, which means my 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 rotor profile changes um, because that uh, neodymium is actually stronger than iron ferrite. Um, you may you may have noticed in the last five to ten years excuse me, ECM motors, the stator stack has, have even gotten smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason they've gotten smaller is again, because the rotor has, uh, the rotor field has, has been uh, made stronger with the neodymium magnets. So that's just a little bit more information about the rotor that won't help you diagnose the motor or set your oh, airflow or, sure makes sense. but it's, it's a lot of fun when you know how the toaster works without having to take the whole thing apart. Excellent. <laughs> So we're going to uh, apply that to the uh, constant airflow motor. That was the technology that was introduced back in 1987, mm -hmm. constant airflow. We, we left off at 2005, about 15% of the industry had started using constant airflow motors, but at, over 18 years, wow, it's a long time. You'd think that it would have had more of an impact on the industry, but it makes a lot of sense when you understand that constant airflow motors are only used in premium tier systems. So, sure. you know, um, two-stage heat, two-stage cool systems started in the late 80s, same time these motors were introduced. And so this motor, uh, the constant airflow premium level motor was only used in premium level systems. So if you think about that pie chart again, 85% uh, still PSC, 15% premium level ECM, that kind of agrees with the way most contractors sell equipment, right? About about 15%, depending on the market or region you're in, 15% yeah. is your premium level systems and the other 85% is probably a mix of your mid-tier and your builder's grade level equipment. And when I'm in front of most contractors, like, yeah, it's pretty much, you know, how, other than the, the rare contractor that sells a lot of premium or mm -hmm. no premium, that's, it pretty much washes out with the industry. So it makes sense why that motor, you know, it's kind of like uh, we, we kind of launched I like to use, again, I use, like to use goofy analogies. It's kind of like we, we kind of launched like Tesla, right? We came out with our $80,000 car first, and then later came out with the affordable $35,000 oh, okay. car. <laughs> Here's option B. So right. They, Here's option B for the masses, the right? <laughs> like we wanted it to. <laughs> exactly. So um, then, uh, and I, I don't think I've mentioned this yet. So ECM motors, uh, uh as a whole, and, and they can be a little higher or a little lower than the number on the screen, but mm -hmm. as a whole, an ECM motors around uh, indoor blower motor, outdoor fan motor, 48 frame, one horsepower and below. I don't want anybody, oh, I, yeah, I know my motor's 89. So they're roughly 80% efficient. They can be as much as 85 and they may, be, they may fall a little bit below 80% depending on where they're operating, but they're about 80% efficient. If you remember, I said that P 
PSC motors are between 60 and 70, mm -hmm. depending on where they're operating. If they're operating at lower speeds, they could be operating as low as 50 or 40 percent efficient. Mm -hmm. So we're anywhere from 10 to 50 percent more efficient than the PSC motor, depending on where we're operating it. And again, keep in mind, this motor was primarily applied to premium level two-stage systems. So it's going to spend a lot of time operating at the lower speeds because two-stage systems spend a lot of time operating in their first stage capacity. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, uh, you know, we talked about this in, uh, in episode one, you know, these are communicative motors. If you want to know more about that, go back to episode right. one um, and then you can get all that information. We're, we're, we're in high level mode here. So we're not, mm -hmm. we're not drilling, we're not drilling down there. <laughs> um, these motors again, off, uh, often referred to as variable speed. Um, and they have, they're made in two very common styles. And I say two, we make them, right. we Gentech, the for, formerly branded GE motors, make them in two styles, one with a five pin line voltage and the 16 pin communication, and one with the five, five pin line voltage and the four pin communication. Um, but that holds, so the, it, so we, one, of our, one of our largest competitors makes the uh, motor similar to the five pin, four pin, and then some of our other competitors make either different size pins or they use just all wires, but almost all of them are using either PWM or serial communication. Yeah. So, and the only reason I say that is if you go back and watch episode one, you're not really, you're not gonna just learn about Gentech motors. You're gonna learn oh. technology that'll apply to multiple brands of motor technologies. Indeed. So um, here's where it gets really interesting. Besides the electrical efficiency and this, and, and this weird thing called the permanent magnet rotor, these motors by by program can have an operating range of 300 to 1500 rpm that's pretty crazy so that's like going from uh an eight pole motor or even a i don't if, if there is such a thing as a 10 12 yeah there's a 12 pole motor yeah. all the way up to a six pole motor yeah. all in one motor and the manufacturer of the appliance doesn't have to buy 10 different motors they can program that motor as it's coming down the line you know in this system i need between uh, 600 and 800 RPMs for my two-stage system. And the next system I need between 800 and 1,000. And my next one, I, they can they can program that motor for multiple systems without having to buy individual SKU ratings for each each uh, you know wired and wound motor. Um, so very be, became a very um, um, highly sought after for those premium level systems. Very versatile for the manufacturer. Also opened up the manufacturer to create airflow points that they're just were not possible with PSC motors. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we talked about it in any of our episodes, but you know, the MERV rating has, has come up after COVID MERV 13, mm -hmm. running your fan continuously and running your fan continuously is very valuable for many reasons. But if you've got a PSC motor, it's going to cost you quite a bit of money mm -hmm. in, in an ECM. I'm, I'm actually running 50% or more efficient than a PSC motor when I'm running at, 600 or less rpms yeah. and and, an e, and this ecm for example is going to run 600 or less rpms still around 80 percent efficient wow so that's that's pretty huge when it came to um iaq yeah indeed um so that uh, that was the next bullet point only slight loss in efficiency again you know most of the manufacturers of appliances they didn't at least in the early years, they didn't change the blower wheel. They didn't change the size of the blower wheel, the pitch of the blade. They still went with the same blower wheels they were using for six pole or eight pole because they didn't have to, right? Mm. This motor has an operational range that covers both six pole and eight pole. No reason to change anything except slide the motor in and program it for whatever I want it to do. Mm, nice. Um, as we already talked about, well suited for the wider airflow ranges of multi-stage and in the future, variable capacity systems and very well suited to zoning systems, you know, where in the early years of zoning with PSC motors, uh, dump zones, bypasses, bypasses with barometric or, or actuated dampers. If you didn't get that right, you had noise issues, you had limit trip issues um, with, with, a, with an ECM motor in a OEM zoned system. Uh, the OEM zone board simply tells the motor. Hey, I'm only going, I've only got 20% of the ductwork open. So run 20% of the airflow mm -hmm. and the motor is just compliant. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I love so you, that. Yeah. You get only the airflow you need. It's kind of, kind of mm -hmm. slick. Yep. Um, and I think we talked about that one. The, 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 the manufacturer has the ability to program the uh, operating point of that motor anywhere across that operating range. So uh, a couple of charts to have some fun with, and we, we, 
We talked about this a little bit in episode one on constant airflow motors, but I wanted to bring it back up again. So constant airflow also is a operating program, right? So it's an ECM, but it's a constant airflow ECM. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means it can maintain airflow when static pressure changes. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means it's got like its own internal gas pedal that it operates automatically. Mm-hmm. So when, when you set the cruise control in your car, the car, mic, the computer in the car takes over the gas pedal and either gives more gas or less gas to maintain the miles per hour. In a constant airflow ECM, it basically does the same thing with the electricity. The microprocessor takes over and says, okay, I'm either going to add torque and RPMs to uh, uh, maintain CFM at high stack pressure, or I'm going to take away torque and take away RPMs to maintain CFM at uh, lower static pressure. But what I end up with is that green line. I end up with a, I don't, you know, we, what did we used to call these performance charts, Cliff? Clifton, sorry. (laughs) We used to call we used to call them performance curves. Performance curve because they right. had- <laughs> because they had a curve to them. But, but it, it that that term doesn't work too much anymore when you've got a constant airflow motor. It's a performance line. That's right. <laughs> so you end up with an airflow, and and many manufacturers instead of providing um, uh, performance charts, yeah. they'll they'll literally just say when the dip switches are set to one on two off, you're Ooh. gonna get you're gonna get twelve hundred. There There's you know it, you you used to show airflow at one uh, point one, airflow at point two, airflow at point three. But you don't need to show that anymore because it's just 1,200 across the board. I've seen a lot of them just saying static pressure between here and here. Exactly. And you'll be there. Yep. Anywhere in between. There you go. So I'm often asked about that, that, you know, how, well, how does it really do that? How does it know? One of the things we didn't, we, 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 I, I mentioned, but I didn't really go, go deep on is, you know, how does the microprocessor know what RPM the motor's running at? How does it know when it's sped it up to the right value? So on and so forth. And in the early years of motor technology, um, some people have heard the, the term um, uh, pickups or, um, oh God, I just, I just went blank. Um, rotor rotor position feedback. There's a term for that, and I just oh, uh, you know, position sensor. P- yeah, position sensors. Anyway, so um, but an ECM doesn't need a, a position sensor. It doesn't need that pickup to read when the rotor comes mm-hmm. past it because the rotor is a big magnet. Yeah. So in an ECM, what what it literally does is uh, it watches the poles of the uh, stator, and it watches as the magnet goes by the poles and cre- creates a back EMF. Mm-hmm. And it reads that back EMF to know exactly where the rotor is. That's mm-hmm. how it knows when it's going the right direction. Mm-hmm. And that's also how it knows what the RPMs are. Mm. So it knows what the RPMs are. Great. Big deal. It doesn't know how many RPMs to speed up to when the static pressure goes up or goes down. And that's true. It doesn't. Um, but what it does know is every constant airflow motor is characterized by the manufacturer of the appliance before it's used in in the system so okay. they they teach it exactly what torque and what rpm equals a specific cfm at a specific static pressure and so that characterization software characterizes the motor at lower cfms and lower static pressures and higher cfms and higher static pressures and with a few data points across the entire mm-hmm. range then the algorithm the computer fills in the middle yeah. Yeah. and so this is what uh, an operating point would look like inside the motor inside the brain of the motor so <clears throat> this happens to be 800 cfm but so and we call that the operating line mm-hmm. there'd be an there'd be an operating line once characterized for every cfm value but let's say the motor turns on and uh, it finds its operating point so the motor's going to turn on it's going to start adding torque the rpm is going to come up it's going to turn on and as soon as it hits the red line It just stops applying torque, right? The RPMs go up as the torque comes up. So all it has to really do is keep increasing torque until torque and speed land on the line because the line is 800 CFM. The motor doesn't care what the static pressure is. It just knows it needs to operate on the line. So let's say the static pressure goes up. First thing that's going to happen, we're going to unload the wheel. Our RPMs are going to drift up. Mm -hmm. We go from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. Point B is not on the red line. So how does the microprocessor get back to the red line? It's got to bring the RPMs up. So it adds torque yep. until the RPMs get up to the point where it runs back into the red line. Mm-hmm. Once it hits the red line, it's again making 800 CFM. Again, does the motor care what the CF, the, the, the uh, static pressure is? No, but it's been taught how to maintain airflow 
by being taught what that operating line is across the static pressure range. Hmm. Love that. Yep. So then the last thing that I think is kind of interesting, and all, all ECM motors that we build have this, um, they have, it does have a speed limit. And the speed limit, so it doesn't care what the static pressure is, right. but it does have a sort of a safety. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you know, I love analogies. Think of your, your car that's less than five years old. In neutral or park, if you try and rev the engine, you're only going to get about 1,000 or 1,500 RPMs before it's going to start coughing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that coughing is it's running into the rev limiter. Um, so ECMs have rev, a, a rev limiter or what we call a speed limit as well. So while they don't know what the static pressure is, they do know that if they get to a certain operating RPM, the static pressure must be really high. Otherwise, they wouldn't be operating at that high of an RPM. When they get to that RPM limit, even if the static pressure continues to go up and try and drag that RPM up, the motor can actually reduce torque or actually take power away from the windings bring, and maintain that RPM below that uh, uh, speed limit line, essentially it becomes a, a, a motor protection, yeah. right? Because if I operate above that line, I'm going to operate at a current and a thermal value that's not going to be conducive to long life. Yeah. And I've seen manufacturers utilize that for a blower fault code. Absolutely. Hey, you know, uh, yep. What, and what would it indicate? Uh, well, high RPMs. Why? Well, yeah. probably high static pressure. And there's one manufacturer, and I'm absolutely giving it away because they worded exactly like this, but the the motor is outside of the valid range. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that's all we're going to say about that. <laughs> I like that. There you go. So uh, any questions on this, Clifton, before I move no, on? I didn't I didn't I, see any questions. All I'm seeing is a lot of nerds out there having a good time. A lot time. of people going, <laughs> Uh, fellow stuff. nerds that wasn't meant to be rude fellow <laughs> nerds that's right i'm so glad you did this particular chart though because it does help make sense because i always knew that we use back emf but i didn't really know how it was tying the actual static pressure in but now it really is starting to make a lot more sense we're not and i think what we're going for earlier was like hall effect sensor you know Thank some type you. Of, yeah, some type of a a trigger that's looking yes. for a position or but in our case we're actually measuring that small amount of voltage just being applied on the back side. You know, we push too far, eventually we're going to actually generate just a little bit of voltage. And that's what we're using for back electromagnetic force. Exactly. So the same way you're able to pedal that bike and, and turn on light bulbs, this yeah. magnet spinning inside of that stator, if one of those, if, if one of those stators is not, if one of those poles is not yeah. being energized, it's this producing. rotor rotating is going to create back EMF in that. And that's what the microprocessor is watching. Exactly just measuring the voltage. Yes, sir. All right. So, and, and this is going to be valuable later when we talk about mm. constant torque motors yep. as well. Yep. Uh, and, and it's really going to help set up the difference. So I'm going to go back. Well, I'm, I, this, I'll stay here. It's fine. So I have instructors, technicians, people on the phone constantly saying like, um, which one is the real ECM? Uh, which one are, are they both variable speed? What's, the this, ECM, what's, the, yeah, what's this new CTM thing? You know, so I, I think that uh, even though I don't have the time to teach all this yeah. higher level, nice to know, I call yeah. Cliff Clavin information yeah. yep. for those of you that remember Cheers, yep. you know, but some of this nice to know information really makes everything make a little more sense and adds clarity, which is why I loved the, you know, looking through a fuzzy lens description mm -hmm. you put on this. It's, it's just perfect. So this is where we left off in our history lesson. We left off at 2005. Yeah. And, and I told you there's going to be a reason why yeah, I chose 05. in that area. All right. So um, the ECM had been around for about 18 years. Only f We're in the indoor blower category. Only about 15% of the industry was using it. So I'm going to ask the audience, and I don't know if you want to wait this long or not, but what happened in 2006 in our industry? What, what event? happened and don't don't say your kid was born even though that was that would be cool but what event in hvac industry excuse me happened in 2006 I need to get a drink of water come on somebody i thought you were going to put up the jeopardy music <laughs> i didn't have it i didn't i didn't i didn't prep you for that i really wanted it so bad but i did not have it well, i'm uh, sure okay. somebody will hit it hit it in a second here but i don't want to give you too much fer that was Close. That was 2019, but in, in 2006, it was drum roll, please. It was the 13 SEER regulation. So in 2006, we had the 13 SEER regulation, and look at the pie. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rock mm. back and forth. This is 2005. This is 2006. Man, wow. Change. So 
half the industry, this is new equipment built yeah. in 2006, the indoor blower motor technology, 40% of it shifted to constant torque ECM in one year. Wow. And that was, and that was due to the 13 cigar regulation. That's Previously, totally. the minimum sear was 10. Um, you know, a 10 to a 13 sear jump is a big jump. Mm -hmm. yeah. And manufacturers mm -hmm. found out that by switching from a, a PSC motor to an ECM, mm -hmm. they could get anywhere from a half to a whole to even a one and a half sear point just, just by, by changing the motor. The motor. Mm. So they, in some cases, they were getting halfway to the new regulation just by changing the motor technology. So almost all of them did. But here's where it got weird. Uh, and, and, it got, and I didn't notice this, this oddity until a couple of years later, later meaning after 2006, uh, doing training in the field where I was doing training in uh, the Midwest. And I was talking about these new constant torque motors. And it, I, it was like, they, they had no clue what I was talking about. Sorry, a little John Cena there for you. They had no clue what I was talking about. And uh, so I, I started, you know, you know, you know, the 13 sear regulation had brought in all these constant torque motors. And what I realized was I was teaching uh, in a region where the primary indoor appliance was a fossil fuel appliance. Absolutely. The 13 sear yeah. regulation mm -hmm. didn't have to regulate the technology of the motor in a fossil fuel appliance because the fossil fuel appliance didn't have an electrical rating at the time. It only had oh. AFUE. AFUE. So yeah. we kind of split the industry in half or the country in half. Uh, and if you, you know, if you, if any of you've ever seen the U S map with the, the sear, the sear changes, especially when we split the sear, it's kind of like, uh, and it, it's kind of like we drew a horseshoe yeah. around the U S just inside the coastal states and just above say Texas, Oklahoma, Everything outside that is primarily air handlers and package systems, all electric systems, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everything inside the U, and you have your fringe areas, you know, mm -hmm. upper Florida has gas, lower Florida doesn't, but it, everything inside the U is fossil fuel. So if you were outside the U in 2006, seven, eight, nine, you started seeing these motors. You, I, you know, I'm teaching in those areas. Oh yeah, we see those all the time inside the U, I have no idea what you're talking about because it's mm -hmm. not, it's not shown up there yet. So mm -hmm. we really kind of divided the industry by air handlers and package systems and fossil fuel That's systems. The, fo the fossil <laughs> fuel industry kept right on using PSC motor technology as the primary motor in, in um, single stage, mid tier and below. And the only time they saw ECM was in the premium level systems. Whereas in the all electric systems, it was basically all ECM since 06. Man, that explains so much. When we talk to educators about ECMs and, you know, introducing ECM education into their classroom, some of them are like, well, we don't even see. We didn't, took forever before we seen ECMs. That's yep. well, right. Here's why. Yeah, no, exactly. Right. You didn't see it for yeah. a long time. And so you may have to rebrush up on what ECMs are. And that's what we're here for. Absolutely. All right, so now we've got a new motor to talk, a new ECM to talk about. It's the constant mm -hmm. torque. So we're not going to revisit the 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 AC to DC, the 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 um, um, uh, frequency drive, the permit mate. Mm -hmm. All of those components are the same in a mm -hmm. constant torque motor. Um, in fact, when this motor came out, if you if you look at it, and if you think if I if I rotated that motor, so if I if I moved it, I know I've only got that the lower half here, but if all you saw was this, you know, you might think. That looks an awful lot like a PSC motor. I just, you know, it's just got plugs instead of wires like a PSC motor. Yeah. Um, and it acts a lot like a PSC motor, as we're going to find out. But it is an ECM motor. So what we did to the ECM motor we were building in 2005, which was the premium level motor, was we made a lower cost version of that motor, a simple, simpler version of that motor, that is the exact same electrical efficiency. So it was a lower cost version of the existing ECM. So we went from the, and I don't know the, the Tesla brands, but we mm -hmm. went from the, we went from the $80,000 Tesla to the $35,000 Tesla, mm -hmm. uh, made it more affordable, same electrical efficiency. And uh, that made it easier for manufacturers to adopt it in place of a PSC motor uh, with the uh, price difference between the two being a lot closer than the price difference between a PSC and a, and a premium level ECM. So same electrical efficiency, but this is a simple multi-speed motor. Um, this is, and, and again, I'm not gonna go through all the connections because um, we did that in episode two, mm -hmm. um, but uh, powered with line voltage, most commonly operated as a multi-speed five-speed motor using, excuse me, 24 volts AC to run the motor. Um, commonly recognized by this plug that we call, well, I've, I've coined the term. I don't know if it's gonna mm -hmm. stick. 
If it does, when I die, somebody will say, oh, that's a Mohanley term. That would be really cool. Uh, but the nine terminal plug, you know, yeah. not, not, I didn't put a lot of brain power into it. It's right. got nine terminals and there's, there's, there's a blank there. Mm -hmm. um, so here again, we have a, we have a motor that has a wider operating range, even, even though it's the, the, the lower, you know, the, the, the cousin to the, the, the variable speed mm -hmm. motor, the, the, the constant airflow motor with all the bells and whistles, mm -hmm. this, this cousin still has an operating range wide enough to cover six pole and eight pole motors. Sure. So still really has the capability to be used in two stage applications, mm -hmm. but primarily used <clears throat> because it was early, early offered and still is today as a five speed motor, primarily used in single stage mid tier equipment and builders grade equipment mm -hmm. again because it's in, profiles what's that pre-program profiles for each of yep these. and we're gonna we're gonna dive into that on the next slide so mm -hmm. again because it's an ecm only slight loss in efficiency mm -hmm. still applied to the same blower wheels and outdoor fan blades so manufacturer didn't have to Locking. change their wheels and their yeah. fans they simply had to slide in a motor and again, very well suited to take the place of that PSC motor mm -hmm. and help the manufacturers go from 10 sear to 13 sear. So you need to give it low voltage speed signals instead of high voltage speed signals. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So let's talk a little bit about that constant torque. So it provides, mm -hmm. so now, now, we, now we can continue to use our term, our airflow curve, mm -hmm. because a constant torque motor is not a constant airflow motor and this is where the oh it's the littler brother or it's the it's the it's the not so ecm or the fake psc or the you know, whatever you want to call it the other you know the other one's the real ecm this is the not so really so the, the constant torque motor is not constant airflow when you and i, I think personally even though i i'm, I'm being kind of nerdy about the terms if you keep using the terms they make sense in your brain a constant airflow motor is going to maintain airflow Air. A constant torque motor is only going to maintain torque. That should be a, a very easy re way to remember. They're not the same motors. They're not going to perform the same in regards to airflow performance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and quite simply, as we discussed it even more in depth in episode two, this, this motor has an airflow curve very similar to a PSC motor. The green line is the constant torque. Is it a little better than a PSC mm -hmm. motor at higher static? Yeah, but I mean, what are we talking about? 50 CFM? Yeah. Yeah, 50 CFM across the range from 1100 to, you know, 1050 at 0.9 static. So we're not talking about enough performance to main, you know, to not keep the coil from freezing or not keep the limit from tripping if the static pressure gets too high. Because that was not the design of this motor. So the desi design of this motor was to mimic mimic a PSC yep. but give That's but give the electrical efficiency of an ECM motor. Perfect sense. So um, then one of the things that I mentioned before, hey, this is going to come up later, that programmability. So this motor, it covers the range of a six pole and an eight pole motor, and it's got five speed taps. Hmm. Well, that means you can have any five RPM values between six and 1200, if that's the operating hmm. range of the motor. Right. Uh, or any torque per, uh, percentage from zero to 100 percent value of that motor. Uh, and that's actually a more accurate way of describing it. So yes, it does have a six to 1200 RPM operating range, but when you put 24 volts on one of those taps, you're not really telling the microprocessor, I want 800 RPMs. You're telling the microprocessor, I want 32% torque. And that 32% torque may create 600 RPMs, 800 RPMs, 1000 RPMs, but whatever it is, it's what the manufacturing engineer selected for the heating airflow or the cooling airflow or the the options for different airflow for different static pressures. Um, but that's where I said that discussion about a PSC motor actually being a multi-torque motor, not a multi-speed motor, uh, helps this motor make sense. It's yeah. called constant yeah. torque, but the whole industry still calls this motor a multi-speed motor. In reality, it's a multi-torque motor. Mm. So it, it just depends on if you just want to stick with the multi-speed. Oh, that makes sense to me, and I'll keep using it. That's fine. I, I'm, it's not my place but to tell you you can't use that term. Yeah. But if if you want to if you want to completely understand the technology, what's what's programmed in the microprocessor, what's activated when you energize those taps is a torque value, not an RPM value. Man, that makes so much sense. If I'm an OEM manufacturer of equipment, and especially if I was a single stage, like I've got a 95% single stage furnace, I could use that motor probably on everything from 40,000 up to 120,000 BTUs with different program points along the way. You, you, and you could, that's a great, mm -hmm. great point. 
So if you used the three quarter or the one horsepower motor, you could absolutely probably cover that entire range. Yeah. The, ch the the challenge is in your 40,000 BTU appliance, Easy. you'd have a motor that's probably an inch and a half longer than it right. needs to be. And you'd have a motor that probably has additional cost that you don't, that you don't want to put in there. Yeah. But, but, but certainly where you used to use four different horsepower ratings of PSC yeah. motors to cover that range well, and yeah. maybe, 10 20 or 30 skews mm -hmm. to cover six pole or eight pole or the different windings you wanted for the different torque values you can get you can absolutely get away with two skews to cover that entire range yeah. and you're also covering one and a half to three ton and three and a half to five ton with those right. two motors as well man i love that yeah pretty cool mm -hmm. um so one thing we mentioned in module two, and if, if anybody, you know, so far I'm talking a lot about being a multi-speed, five-speed motor. Anybody that remembers module two, or if you watch these modules, uh, uh, episodes in progression, uh, you're going, well, wait a minute, you said module two, these things are communicating now. And they are. Uh, the communicating technology has landed on constant torque motors, um, PWM and nine-speed, excuse me, doesn't turn them into a constant airflow motor but does turn them into a, a, a variable torque or a variable capacity motor. So instead of just having five speeds, it has infinite speeds in PWM. So if, if, with, a P, with a variable PWM signal, the manufacturer could absolutely put this motor into a variable capacity gas furnace or vari variable capacity uh, air conditioner, and that motor operating uh, point could follow the capacity of the system would still be constant torque. So it'd still be operating following the static pressure of the system. It would not maintain airflow, but it would have the variable capacity capability of its older brother, older cousin, whatever mm -hmm. nepotism I re rated to earlier. Oh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I had a question that came in and I it's a that. Good, good point and it's a great one to bring up. It's one of the beauties of these ECMs. Um, it's not smaller or bigger. Um, we are able to build this in the same size frames. Uh, yes. And I'm not sure if the question was related to, um, it being bigger this way or being bigger this way. But right. so most of the motors in, in HVAC residential, like commercial, uh, you know, up to five, well, five ton or less, 150,000 BTU or less, you know, are using 48 frame motors. 48 frame means approximately five and a half inches diameter across the motor. But what I said earlier, and maybe that's what the question was alluding to, is the stator stack, the the dis this distance on the motor, end shield to end shield, yeah. has absolutely gotten smaller because of the permanent magnet rotor. However, when you add the add a mod to the back of it, right? When you add the like that's a pretty good catch. When yeah, you add the <laughs> add the control on the back of it, <laughs> now you know now you end up with a motor that's maybe as long or even just a little bit longer um, than the original motor. But when you when you look at the technology, and that's what we're kind of talking about now is understanding the technology, the motor itself, the stator stack itself is, is absolutely smaller than its uh, induction motor counterparts. Yep. Yep. Okay. I got to bring out my toys. That's kind of fun. I Usually they just fun. collect dust up there on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we left off with the, uh, the big change, right? Mm -hmm. 2006, 13 seer regulation. Mm -hmm. Half the industry shifted over to constant torque motors mm -hmm. and drum roll, please. I'm going to fast forward all the way to 2019 because mm -hmm. as um, uh, who said that earlier, Jason, Jason. Uh, said earlier, the uh, FER rating uh, occurred in 2019, which was a rating specifically focused at fossil fuel appliances. Mm -hmm. um, it was sorry, regulation. It was a regulation that said basically to manufacturers for every CFM you create, it can only cost you so many watts. So it's like a miles per gallon, but it's a watts per CFM. Sure. And so, and I, I want to reiterate that both the FER regulation and the 13 SEER regulation, neither one of them said the manufacturer had to use ECM. Right. You just had and to stand up. Yeah. And on, on the flip side of that coin, neither one of them said you couldn't use a PSC motor. Hmm. What they did, though, is they raised the efficiency bar so high they made it very oh, difficult to hit those efficiency values right. with a PSC motor. So again, the FER regulation said nothing about have to use ECM, but if you look at the pie, <laughs> bye bye PSC. Yeah, exactly. you know, mo most manufacturers shifted all their fossil fuel appliances up to um, ECM. Now, where did those PSCs go? Did they go into constant airflow or constant torque? Well, they went into constant torque. You know, the, the constant airflow driven systems 
didn't need anything to hit the higher efficiencies. They're already there. Um, we needed to shift those uh, mid-tier, mid, sorry, mid-tier and um, uh, builders grade systems that were still using PSC motors up to an ECM to get to that FER regulation. I should also point out that um, just because this pie chart shows no PSC motors on it doesn't mean that today there are no manufacturers making air handlers, package systems, or um, uh, fossil fuel appliances with PSC motors. Again, remember what I said a minute ago, there's nothing in the regulation that re, um, saying that the manufacturer can't use a PSC motor. If they can hit 13 sear, which is obviously now 14 sear, if they get minimum in, 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 the, in the horseshoe, um, if they can hit the uh, FER regulation with a PSC motor, they can build it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe a few manufacturers are, but it just made my pie chart a lot cleaner not to have a, be a little sliver in right. there. <laughs> So I'm going to pause there. I see a question came in. I'm going to see if you have any questions, Clifton, because after this, we're going to shift gears completely and go to the outdoor fan motor. No, I think that's good. I was just, uh, Todd was making a point of why we changed the wattage for CFM. So Todd, thanks for putting it out there. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So with no questions, we will make that change. And now we're talking about the outdoor fan motor. So now you have to go back to 1999. Mm -hmm. And the reason you have to go back to 1999 is outdoor fan ECM motors were introduced in, can you guess? Can you guess? 2000. 2000 maybe? <laughs> so in 1999, basically all the technology used in the outdoor fan was PSC direct drive. Yes, there probably were a few shaded pole motors still being used out there, but for the most part, it was all PSC direct drive motors. Um, fast forward to a couple of years ago, 2022, and you'll see why I stopped there in a second. Mm -hmm. um, we introduced ECM outdoor fan motor technology in the year 2000. Fast forward to a couple of years ago, about 15% of the industry has shifted to that motor, that ECM motor. What's interesting about the use of the outdoor fan motor is it's predominantly found in your 16 sear two stage and above. That's right. Now there are a few manufacturers and I'm not going to use names. If you know who they are, you know who they are. Mm -hmm. There are a few manufacturers building 15 sear single stage units and they're using ECM motors. That's fine. But the majority of the industry that's using ECM in the outdoor fan market are using it in a 16 sear two stage system. And that's important for a couple of reasons. One for the next discussion about sear, regulation and two for the discussion about how they're operated. So <laughs> let, let's talk about SEER first. So okay. introduced in 2000, in 2006, we had the 13 SEER regulation. Mm -hmm. So we introduced this, the motor technology in 2000, six years later, 13 SEER happens. Any influence on the outdoor fan motor technology? Nope, because the ECM is not being used until 16 SEER. So there's the 13 SEER regulation really doesn't affect it. 2015, we saw the southern regions move up to 14 sear. Mm -hmm. Did that influence the use of uh, the motor technology in the outdoor fan application? Nope, because they're still making 14 sear with a PSC motor. Exactly. Uh, now, you'll find out why I stopped at 22. This last year, we went up to 15 sear in the outside the horseshoe and 14 sear inside the horseshoe. So does that affect the motor use? No, because I manufacturers are hitting 14 and 15 sear mm -hmm. with PSC motors. So What's yet what, what we're what I'm what I'm even yet to find out because I haven't you know done my my download of 2023 yet is did manufacturers start building more units with, with constant ECM. speed or uh, ECM motors just because they you know they see the writing on the wall there's going to be <clears throat> the they need a they need a different uh, a more of a, uh, a difference cost difference uh, sear difference between the minimum and what they're offering as their even their mid or their premium tier systems. Um, so that might have some influence. You know, we might be at 20 or maybe even 25%. Um, but I think this is a pretty good way for everyone to realize um, what types of systems they're going to find these in and where they're going to find them. I'm in Wisconsin. <laughs> we don't sell a lot of two-stage 16-plus sear systems, hmm. even even today. Um, there's there's just not enough cooling season to get a payback uh, unless your family is like mine. Um, I have people in the house that have, have uh, breathing issues and we run air conditioning all summer long. Right. Um, so I do have a high sear system in my home. Um, but the majority of the population in the Midwest is not going to have a high sear. Conversely, and this is uh, relates to the constant torque disparity back in 06, conversely in the southern and the coastal and the coastal areas, 
they've probably been installing two stage 16 sear for a long time mm -hmm. as long as it's been out um, because there's value in the dehumidification of a multi-stage system there's value in the um, uh, energy savings to be had over the lifetime uh, of that system in that market Makes sense. Absolutely. All right. Did I see a question come in or was it? Yeah, uh... no, one that came in about programming and we actually, um, mechanical environments, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the programming of ECMs from the OEM level. That would have been in episode two. Well, we talked about a little bit one and two. So if we go back and watch our previous episodes, you'll see that the programming is very much done from the manufacturers. And then knowing what those speed taps are, you really have to look at the, the label for the motors and themselves because they could be programmed differently from the manufacturers. Yep. And just a shameless plug for us, uh, you know, even though the manufacturer programs those motors unique, we do now make universal replacements for those motors. Absolutely. They're called Evergreen. I love them. You can set anything that you want. When there you go. A programmable, usable motor. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So this will be a, a little, sh a much shorter tour than we, than we took, a, sh a shallower rabbit hole, if you okay. will, than we took on the indoor blower motors. So I've already said predominantly used in 16 sear systems. Again, 80%. Now, in the outdoor fan motor, many PSC outdoor fan motors are, were and still are, because they're still being used, hitting um, the 65 or 70% efficiency rating. Uh, because they're optimized at their most efficient point, their most efficient operating point in that, out, excuse me, in that outdoor system. Yeah. And because they're running at one speed, they're not multi-speed right. motors. Right. So they run at their most efficient point all the time. Um, so I'm often asked, well, you know, how, just how much more electrical efficiency is there? It's not as much as it is on the indoor side, but it's enough for the manufacturer that when they get to 16 sear, there's value in spending the money on that motor versus that much energy savings to, to help you know progress the sear along. Mm -hmm. um, so again, generally recognized. Oops, sorry. Generally recognized by the control on the back of the motor, and I I, I put a motor. And obviously, it's upside down, right? The it, the shroud is off, and I turned it upside down so you can see the motor. But you know, when you look inside, you know, oh wow, that motor looks kind of funky looking. And there's you know there there's still there's still look almost oh no, what. There's too many wires. Yeah, what is that? It's an ECM motor. Right. So, you know, a kind of silly way to describe it. How do you recognize it's an ECM? Well, look at it. Uh, you know, it, it's very obvious that it's an ECM motor. But what's not obvious and what is sometimes very difficult to determine unless you do um, scrutinize the schematic, and this we covered in module three or episode three, um, was how is it communicated? It could be a multi speed motor. Um, that's turned on and off with 24 volt AC, just mm -hmm. like the constant torque, or it could be a PWM communicated motors. Uh, and so you, you really do need to look at the schematic. They could have, this, I could have a five wire motor that is a single speed 24 volt AC actuated motor, or I could have a five wire motor that is a PWM motor. Mm -hmm. um, so I really do need to look at the schematic and not make any assumptions about the amount of wires or the or the wire colors. Yeah, especially as we get into inverter technology <laughs> and unitary systems. Exactly. And you 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 sometimes I think you're reading my mind, which is a little scary, but hey, I'm telling uh, you, man, we <laughs> we are the same kind of nerd. <laughs> <laughs> so um what so the next thing I was gonna talk about was remote located controls. So um we've we took apart the motor earlier, you know, we showed the difference between the control and the motor. Yeah. In the in the outdoor fan and and in very few but some in indoor blower motors, uh, the manufacturer will request us to take the control off the motor and <clears throat> put an umbilical cord between yeah. the two so they can locate it somewhere else. Mm. Maybe they want to make the cabinet a little skinnier, right. you know, whatever reason. In the outdoor fan, yeah. it happens quite often where you'll look inside and you'll, and if you're not looking down, so you can see the red circle, mm -hmm. if you're not looking down, you just look at that motor and all you see is motor. Uh, oh, that, okay. It must be a PSC motor. I don't, I don't see the control on the back anymore. Right. Um, but then you go and follow the wires and no fan wires go to the capacitor. So it mm -hmm. must be shaded pole, right? No, no, no. It's not shaded pole either. Mm -hmm. So if you look a little closer, you can see that control in there in the circle. And uh, you can see that it is an ECM motor with a remote located control. But to your point, which I would have forgot to bring up. So thank you. Um, we're starting to see inverter driven systems where that motor control, which is really what? You got some uh, rectification circuits, you got a micro, and you got a, a, a frequency drive. Mm -hmm. All of those components are now found on the main circuit board in the corner pillar of that unit, 
and you have no motor control. You only have three mm -hmm. wires going from the big board in that unit all the way to the motor because all the motor control components are mm -hmm. on that primary board. And mm -hmm. what you're seeing going to the motor is just that three, that wire. three wire plug, that That's three it. wire yeah. plug coming from that three phase motor. Um, and that, and so as we always say, read the manual, that's coming, start reading the manuals and you'll start catching those motors and you'll be doing more of your diagnostic on that main board, uh, more than anywhere else. Yeah, I see that for sure. Great, great lead in there. Um, so again, here operating range, 300 to 1200 RPM sounds yeah. like a broken record, but easily covering the six pole and eight pole motors that were used in the space previously, Indeed. only a slight loss in electrical efficiency. Um, and again, here's where it gets really, here's where it started to get a little weird for the outdoor fan motor. <clears throat> because now the engineer at the OEM gets to pick the RPM of that motor, right? In outdoor fan, not being multi-speed in, in your traditional single stage system, right? It was either 1075 or 825. Mm -hmm. They had to build their fan blade, their shroud yeah. to move the at correct the air for the correct TD at 1075. Well, now, you know, we, we, we came along and said, Pick any speed you want. So all of a sudden, you started seeing these really wild-looking fan blades, and and you and they're going so slow you can darn near watch yeah. the thing go around. And of course, the value of that is bigger blade, lower RPMs. We reduce the decibels. Yeah. The the you know the purpose of these wild-looking um, um, blades is to get rid of the old wump wump and have that air kind of fall off the end of the trailing edge of the fan. Um, so we see really odd-looking blades, but the um, technology of the motor was actually what enabled the blade manufacturers giving engineers the ability yes giving yeah. the ability to start making those wild mm -hmm. blades so yeah. you see you see that those more predominant in uh -huh. the ecm systems Ooh. where the the speed of the motor and that so and we talked about this again in episode three um the the challenge with re replacing the outdoor fan ecm with anything generic and w even we don't have one yet is I have no idea what RPM that motor's operating. It on the rating plate, so you can see the rating label right here. It may be listed 1200, 600 to 1200, 800, 700, 800 and 1200, but what you really don't know is how is the microprocessor yeah, yeah. inside programmed, yeah, right? Exactly. I don't I don't I, well, you know, I don't have a laptop here, but let's just right. let's just say this is this is my laptop, okay? I know it's not a laptop, but this is my laptop. What 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 microchip is in it? How is it programmed? Is it is it an Apple or is it a mic? You can't tell just by looking. I mean, in some of the case styles and stuff, you can tell, but there's no way to look at that motor and know what RPM value or values it was programmed at. So in the outdoor fan space, you really need to need to go back to the manufacturer. I see a question came in. Yeah, absolutely, Henry. That's a great question. We highly encourage you to go back because we have all three of them covered. We have our constant airflow, we have our constant torque, and our condenser, all ECM classes, and we dive into how they are operating and how to troubleshoot. So yeah, good question. Absolutely. All right. We almost went backwards with the series, Chris. It's <laughs> great because now we've got everyone hanging in going, okay, I learned all the deep stuff. Now let's do the overhead, and now it all comes together and makes sense for me. You know, I actually thought that when I was um, putting this slide deck together, I'm thinking this probably should have been episode one, but that's all right. We we gave them the nuts and bolts first, and then we, we came back, put them on the stool next to Norm, and had Cliff right. talk to them for an hour. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we'll show you how they work, and we're going to show you how to teach how to. There you go. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, are you serving dinner with this show? <laughs> no, maybe we should. We get some pizza out. Good. We'll be over soon. We're glad everyone's hanging in with this. <laughs> I have a feeling what that comment means is we're having too much fun. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is this is where the, you know, just the, again, the fuzzy lens. I love the way you phrased the, 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 the topic of the show. This is where, you know, you've got all these motors. They all look a little bit different. Um, they're applied to indoor blower and outdoor fan, and they're all ECM. And, and they all technically have different names, constant torque, constant speed, constant airflow. But what gets really weird here for a moment is, <clears throat> so if I ask, I'll, I'll ask you, Cliff, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Clifton. Uh -oh. Oh. This, this motor right here, is it, yeah. is it a constant speed, torque, or, or uh, airflow? I'm gonna go for speed. That is, it's an outdoor fan, outdoor. constant speed. Mm -hmm. These two in the middle, constant speed, torque, or airflow. I'm going to say those are constant. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Constant airflow. 
You bet. And the one on the end? Yeah. Torque. There you go. Now, and that and that after an A2L class earlier today. Oh, so now, now I'm really going to blow your mind. Oh no, you're wrong. Because technically, those motors are nothing until we program them to be something. This motor on the far right could be constant torque. It could be constant airflow, but we predominantly program it for constant speed because of the type of blade it drives and the type of load that, that it uh, uses or, or is driven in, and the fact that it, it, it doesn't see any static pressure changes. So all that motor really needs to do is constantly move the blade at the RPM yeah. that makes the right airflow. So we predominantly build that motor constant speed, but any of them could be programmed for anything. We put constant airflow into the premium motor. Why? Because it was the $70,000 Tesla. We, we gave it all the bells and whistles. And up front. Why did we take that um, that feature out of the constant torque? Because it's the thirty five thousand dollar Tesla. It took, <laughs> took out the so that, you know that's where uh, some people start looking at these motors and go, well, why do you call that one torque? And why why specifically does that nine terminal motor always constant torque? It's just because that's how the industry started adopting the technology. They always put you know we we designed that first motor constant torque with the nine terminal plug mm -hmm. and everybody, including two of my uh, closest competitors, followed by building the same looking motor with the same plug, all in constant torque. So that motor, if I physically saw that motor in a picture, mm -hmm. my first thought is it's gonna be a constant torque motor with five 24 volt speed taps. I'm probably gonna be right 95% of the time. Wow, that's cool. If I look at these two motors, the 16 pin and the, the four pin uh, serial communicated with, with both of them having the five pin line voltage, they're always going to be constant airflow, and they're either going to be uh, PWM or uh, communicated. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, we've got that term variable speed. Yeah. You, and you're going to put that. Don't give me uh, that's a rabbit hole. I'm not going to go down. But that so those are constant airflow motors, whether you want to call them variable speed or not. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got the outdoor fan motor, which is always, at least by today's standards, going to be programmed for constant speed because all I care about is operating the fan blade at the RPM it needs yep. to make the correct air. Now, in a in a in a uh, variable capacity outdoor unit, changing those RPMs from the frequency drive to the motor, whether that frequency drive is you know in a oh, motor control can yeah. or whether it's mounted on the the motherboard, mm -hmm. you know, changing the RPMs means I'm going to change the airflow to match the capacity that's going on in that outdoor unit. Um, but that still doesn't make it a constant airflow or a constant torque motor it's still constant speed once the microprocessor says hey slow down to 800 rpms then the then the frequency drive takes over and says okay i'm gonna i'm gonna keep it at exactly rpm 800 rpm mm -hmm. if uh you know if the wind blows against the blade and slows it down i'm going to increase the torque to bring it back up to mm -hmm. 800 rpm if, mm -hmm. if something makes it go faster i'm going to back off the torque and bring it its only job is to maintain RPM. So hopefully that helps make some of this nice. technology a little more clear, understand why fog we- Fog off from the lenses. Yep, why we have all these names. Yeah, fog <laughs> off the lenses, absolutely. So we're gonna wrap it up with something that um, we could have talked about in each one of the first episodes, but um, true to form, I ran long in all three episodes. Okay. Um, so we, we saved it all for you. information, Chris. Uh, <laughs> and that is diagnosing the motor separately from the motor control. So. Yeah. You can, in some cases, and I will talk about that more in a, in a moment, you can, by the way, I love the comment, I want the Lamborghini motor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you, you can replace the control only. So you can replace just this part if it's the only part that's failed, if you determine that the, the motor portion is good. Um, but, you, but you have to do more diagnostics. So it, you have two options when you have a failed ECM. You can either replace the whole thing, the motor and the control. It's Nine, almost always sold they as one piece terms, yes. or you can replace the control only mm -hmm. but they but that requires diagnostics of the motor to make sure the motor is good we don't want to put a, a new brand new control on a failed motor because that would be bad um you can replace the control on all of the indoor blower motors depending on the oem so but you can't replace the control on outdoor fan motors and i say can't meaning manufacturers don't offer control only parts 
on the outdoor fan motors. Okay. Um, they've been around. They've been around less than the other motors. Right. They're not. Their volume isn't as high as the other motors, right. and their failure rate isn't as high as the indoor blower motors. Again, predominantly due to the volume. Yeah. Um, so they're just not offering the two part, the hole and the and the control only. So this is only going to be applicable to your indoor blower motors. But I also want to urge you to before you. And unless you want to do this for fun, and, and if, you're nerd, if you're nerds like us, you're, you're going to do it for fun. But um, it, I urge you to call the man, you know, so you've diagnosed the motor's failed. It's in a, a train, a carrier, whatever. You call the distributor and say, hey, do you have controls for this? And they say no. Well, then don't waste your time diagnosing the motor because you're going to replace the whole thing anyway. anyway. But if they say yes, then you can go, then you have to diagnose the motor, at least if you want to do a good job. So we're going to take you down that path today. Um, takes about 10 minutes total. I'm um, always at, you know, this take a long time, right? It, and it takes about 10 minutes and really five of those minutes is just for safety. Um, the actual work probably only takes a couple of minutes. Um, and you, you're going to be, uh, doing a winding test. You're going to be doing a face to face test. And just like with any motor, you're going to be checking to make sure the bearings are, are, are solid. Mm -hmm. Um, so the first five minutes you're going to waste are, and you can waste this five minutes while you're making the phone call, you want to turn the power off and wait five minutes and you're waiting for mm -hmm. discharge the, the capacitors to discharge. Mm -hmm. So as I, as I mentioned, anytime the capacitors come up, I don't want anybody to think these, these cute little caps are safe and they're not, they're not, uh, um, uh, uh scary or a safety risk. Mm -hmm. These little caps are about a thousand microfarads a piece. Um, if you were to, if, if one, if the you know, cover was missing and you were, you were to become the ground, it would hurt tremendously. Hurt. <laughs> so, um, turning the power off and waiting five minutes is something you want to do. Go, go have a soda, come back. Then you're going to take the, uh, two, uh, control bolts out. I've already taken my motor completely apart, so I can't show you that, but essentially I've got the motor control mounted onto the back of the motor. When it's on the back of the motor, I've got two quarter inch bolts. I'm just, just going to take those two bolts out and I'll be able to slide the control off of the motor. When I get the control off of the motor, I'm going to have the motor plugged into the motor control. You can stay with the picture or me, whichever one you prefer, it doesn't matter. And uh, I wanna rock that back gently. So um, the, the harness between the motor and the control is very short. And I often get asked, you know, couldn't you make that a little bit longer? Um, one of the reasons we make that short is because between here and the motor, those, the frequencies, are, that's where the PWM has happened. The, you know, 20,000 blips per second is happening. I don't want a lot of, a lot of cord here because that's going to possibly create more Fear. interference that goes out yeah. into the atmosphere. And then, so usually some smart person in the class says, well, then what about the remote control modules? How come it's not a problem with those? Well, if you notice, and I, I'm not going to go back to the picture, but in, in the picture of that remote control, that, that umbilical cord in between just doesn't have three bare cords with their own insulation. There's another sheathing over it and there's a protective sheathing on the inside to protect from that frequency escaping. So really short cable, reach in, grab that latch, unplug that, and now I have the control separated from the motor. Now I can ohm out my what phase? My three phase motor. Mm -hmm. Now we're just gonna do a, uh, a ground test. We're gonna touch, test each phase to ground. Um, we wanna find an unpainted surface mm -hmm. um, that is not connected to the stator. So in this case, it's going to be that little X brace on the back. Um, I already I already knocked the end shield out of this one, but on the case of this motor, there would be a sol solid end shield, so it would look mm -hmm. like this instead yep. of the X brace. Yep. So that's going to be my ground. I'm going to take my meter, check to ground. As long as I have infinity on all my settings, uh, it passes my test, and I can move on to the next test. Um, if I have any continuity to ground, then it fails the test, and there's no reason to go on to the next test. Mm -hmm. If the motor's failed, then obviously got to replace both. So we'll say it passed this test and we'll go to the face-to-face -face test. So now I'm basically touch, touch, uh, ohming out each winding to its brother. Um, so one to two, one to three, two to three. They're not labeled with numbers. So please don't look for the numbers. Um, just pick any three wires and start you know, going through them in order. Um, being a three-phase motor, I just want them all to read the same. Now, there's a lot of discussion about this. And I used to do a, a workshop where I'd bring a whole bunch of motors and we'd own them out. And um, the magnet plays havoc with that ohm reading. So that ohm reading is always floating. 
Anybody that's ever tried to set the gas pressure on a Lennox pulse furnace knows oh, that gas pressure is always moving around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the ohms value on an ECM motor is not just is not just a nice stable number. It's always moving. So you kind of got to look for the range, yeah. um, which is why I put 5.1, 5.3, 5.5. .5. Even if I read, if an, even if I I moved my decimal all the way off and I read five, five and five, or five, six and seven, I would be perfectly happy with five, six and seven. It's close enough. If the motor is failed, I'm going to measure something way off. I'm not going to see a five, a six, and a seven. I'm going to see an open winding, or I'm going to see a direct shorted winding. Yep. Um, that's what you're looking for. Now, maybe I'll see a five, a five, and a 50 or a hundred, because I've, I've got a winding that's almost shorted, but not quite, you know, maybe I got a couple of turns that are, that are close to touching, but not touching. But uh, when I say a couple of turns, these, these, these are the turns where the right. copper mm -hmm. makes it around the turn. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in most cases on motors, and, and those of you that have ohmed out motors, you, you know, usually you've got good ohms or you've got infinite ohms, meaning it's open, or you've got mm -hmm. zero ohms, meaning it's direct shorted. Mm -hmm. You rarely have in between. And that, that's what, really what you're looking for. Um, so, the re uh, oh, uh, th so the last thing is, and I, I keep forgetting that I took mine apart, so I've got to tr try and get this thing back together. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Let me grab a different one real quick. Okay. Uh, now everybody saw that I'm really wearing jeans and I'm not as well dressed as I should be. <laughs> um, so when you take an ECM motor and you give it a spin, especially if you just grab the shaft and give it a spin, or if you grab the blower wheel and give it a spin, a couple of things you're going to notice. One, it, 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 it drags for lack of a better word. Um, it, it's sluggish. It's almost like if, if it was a PSC motor, you would think the, the bearing oil mm -hmm. was coagulated. It was really thick and gooey because it's really, it's really slow. Um, but what I like to recommend if you're going to check the shaft is you either spin the blower wheel mm -hmm. or you hold the shaft and spin the motor, the motor. and let the, mm -hmm. let the inertia show you that that's a good bearing. Yeah. Right. We got no problems there. And another thing you might find is you might feel if you turn it really slow, it'll almost feel like it's segmented or cogging. Yeah, or, yeah. People come up with all kinds of great mm -hmm. terms in classes, but it feels mm -hmm. like it's like clicking from one stage, mm -hmm. one step to another. Well, remember that that rotor is a magnet. That's and right. I showed you it was in three segments, but yeah. most, and I'll just, I'll just pick one of our designs. Uh, this, this design is a 12 pole rotor. So even though there's three iron ferrite magnets, mm -hmm. three, three sections, each one of them has four poles. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, so you're, you're, you're not just, it's not just a three pole. It's actually mm -hmm. a 12 pole. Oh. So six Norths and six Souths. So yeah. that's where all that, that's where all that segmented feel is coming from. So okay. that's a perfectly Ooh, good motor yeah. feeling that drag. Yeah. Now, a good technician, when I say a good technician, ones that are really focused on bearings, they're going to immediately start shaking the shaft, pushing it in and out and making sure there's no slop, right? Yeah. So all, all the ECMs we built, especially in 48 frame from day one, they're all mm -hmm. ball bearing, right? Mm -hmm. So there should be no axial, no up and down, no radial, mm -hmm. no in and out play. And I think I said that backwards. However, and I can, I can, I, I might be able to show that on this particular motor. Yep. I can show it here. However, if you push hard enough, you You'll can actually, you can, you can feel some right. movement. Mm -hmm. And what that movement is, is wow. in, on one side of the end shield, there's a washer called a wavy washer, or yep. I think the engineers call it a thrust washer. Yep. And what that washer does is it sort of sets the rotor into one position. Mm -hmm. It allows it a little bit of movement, but it sets that rotor into a position. So it always stays there. Exactly. Whereas on a brand new PSC motor, you can have as much as a eighth or a quarter inch of, of in and out, in and out play. Right. So, uh, you know, a good bear, a good ECM bearing should have no in and out, no sideways play. But if you push hard enough, you couldn't, you could feel that thrust water, comp uh, thrust washer right. compressing. Um, and it, and it will segment if you, if you're going to, if, if you are the load and you don't have as much inertia as a blower wheel or say, mm -hmm. You know all this girth. Mm -hmm. uh, this I always like to say, test them like a lollipop. Just yep. hold the shaft, and yeah, yeah that's ob that's obviously a good bearing. So, good bearing, good face-to-face -face test, not shorted to ground. We can put a new control on that. She's good to go. If it fails any of those tests, then we have to replace yeah. the whole thing. And I'm going to reiterate one more time, just because I don't like people to waste their time, um, just because your time is so valuable. Call the OEM first and see if that control is available. We do. Uh, I mentioned Evergreen Universal Motors. We mm -hmm. do make some controls in the constant torque motor 
uh, the Evergreen EM, uh, but they're they're close to being phased out. So you you want to okay. if you're going to replace controls, you're probably going to be using OEM. If you're going to be using OEM, please call the distributor first and see if they're available uh, before you spend the time oming out the motor. Okay. Uh, did we have any questions before I wrap it up? I think we, the last question uh, was still the Lamborghini. Yeah, no, I think we're good there. Excellent. So I'm going to wrap it up with the same information I did last time. Go through it pretty pretty quickly. You know, we we've got an app. All the training I just did, all the diagnostics are available in our app. So I'm going to fast forward to, oops, I went one too far. So right there in the resource center in the app, it says Gentech ECM Motor Diagnostics. So you can find a PDF of all the steps for diagnosing motors. Yes, it's on the web as well. Uh, that question just came in, and I'll show that on the next slide. Yep. Um, but in the app, you can find the uh, PDF you can read, or you can find videos of me opening up the motor, yeah. oming it out, Ooh, checking yeah. the voltages, so on and so forth. Um, if you want to watch any of our videos, watch my podcast, watch mm -hmm. this webcast, um, you can go to our training site. All of our training is free, including the stuff we've done here with ESCO. Absolutely. Um, in episode uh, Constant Tort 2, uh, we talked about the constant air, was it? No, episode one, we talked about the constant airflow motor. Um, and that is where we talked about the Evergreen VS and it's a, a wireless uh, profiling tool. And all of our Evergreen motors, all our Evergreen uh, aftermarket universal replacement motors that do both PSC and ECM replacement, you can find the manuals, uh, videos for installation and support uh, right in the app under tech support. So two clicks, one click to get into the uh, Evergreen tech support section, one click to click on the evergreen motor you're using, and you're you're looking at those videos. Um, all of that same information is available. Oh, I didn't mention the name. Duh. Got uh, the, the name of our app is the dealer tool belt. Um, the name of the website is the dealer tool box. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're mirrored, all the same information. One's on the web, one's in, one's in the app, just to make it easy for you to get to. And of course, you can always go directly to our training page, Regal, mmu.com which you very politely put a qr code on the screen for thank you mm -hmm. i appreciate that Absolutely. and uh last but not least of course a shameless plug for the book i wrote um mm -hmm. almost 10 years ago now but what's funny is is i was paging through the book uh, some of the uh, maybe you noticed some of the images in this presentation were from that book. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know that that information is still relevant today. There's not too many changes in the technology in the last ten years. Changes in the equipment, yep. changes in the regulations, but not too many changes in the technology itself. So, and that book is available from both RSES uh, and ESCO. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, I'm going to say uh, oh, one last thing. I do want to mention. So. Um, Every month I do these motor minute tech tips. They're just a couple minutes long. Um, it's like, a, it's like, you know, getting a handout with a one page tech tip, but it's a video you can watch. Right. Um, you can go into our motor master university and you can click on motor minute and you can sign up for those oh, cool. and they will automatically be sent to you via email. Um, you can turn it on, watch the two minute tech mm -hmm. tip, turn it off. Um, I, I, I always like to talk about this one topic that I did cause it was actually the highest hit volume of all of our, Motor Minute Tech Tips, and the title was Why Blower Motors Have a Flat Side on Their Shaft. Really? Believe it or not, that, that of all the tech tips I've done on all the motors, that one got the most hits so far. Oh, kind of, so it kind of gives you an impression of, you know, not everybody knows everything they think they know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So with that, I'm going to go on to my uh, show, show my Star Wars geeky nerdness and put this up. Say thank you, Cliff. I can't, uh, Clifton, sorry, I can't believe we're all done. Um, you're going to have to invite me back at some point. So we can oh, have some heck fun. Yeah, it's always an open invitation, my friend. And I can't <laughs> wait to see you at the conference, which is just right around the corner. Absolutely. So anyone wants to hang out and get a book from Chris and get it signed. We want to see you at the national HVACR education conference. And we'll all be there just really learning how to be better with this industry, how to understand the changes that are happening, see what the innovations are and just be good at delivering so that we can all you know grow as an industry absolutely and have fun doing it and i mean we have some fun <laughs> <laughs> all right everyone i know it's been a long evening i'm so grateful that you hung out with us all of these presentations are available for you on youtube or you can go into our e-learning network at the hvacr uh, learning network and you can actually get credit for these courses if you're looking for that for continuing education so check that out. We'll see you all at the conference. Everyone have a wonderful evening and we will see you next week 
on Did You Know the ESCO H-Back Show. What a great time.